All right, all right. All right. Woo -hoo, woo -hoo. all right, listen, listen. Welcome, welcome to Living Legends. I'm your host, Sway. I'm really excited about this. This is our first episode where we're putting the spotlight on some of the architects of this culture we know and love called hip hop. I'm joined by my right hand, my sniper, the one and only Rich Nice. Everybody give it up for Rich Nice. Hey. Salute. Hey, you got a little clap right there, Rich. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so today I'm honored. I'm honored. I can't tell you how honored I am. Uh, when I first came, and when I first started listening to the music uh, in Northern California out of Oakland, I used to listen on an AM transistor radio, and there was a station called K-Pool in San Francisco. And Marcus Clemens, KK, these are some of the names of these legendary DJs that would play music. And they would play music from New York City. And one of the first songs I ever heard was Super Rhymes. Another song that I heard was by Sequence. I'm going to funk you right on up. I'm going to funk you right on up. But one of the first songs that really popped my eyes open was a song called The Weekend. It was by a group called the Cold Crush Brothers. Man, when you say that... You got to say it with power. Cold Crush Brothers, if you don't know who they are, these guys right here, the Cold Crush Brothers, are very influential in the DNA of what we see in hip-hop today. So when you think of Run DMC, when you think of Leaders of the New School, when you think of Outkast, when you think of Toby and Wigway, when you think of T-Pain, when you think of Ty Dolla Sign, when you think of Drake, all of these artists have the Cold Crush Brothers DNA in their journey, in their music, in their creativity, whether they know it or not. And I have one of the original members of the Cold Crust Brothers with us right now. Give it up for the legendary, the magnificent, the first vegan of hip hop, Easy <laughs> AD. <laughs> yes. Oh, man. What, what an introduction. Oh, man, I could have kept going, but I know we only got so much time, man. You know, uh, when I think of this is a true story, though, I, I really grew up listening to you all. Um, I remember when I first saw Star Wars, that was really the first uh, movie that I saw that kind of introduced me to what it looks like or what it feels like in the streets of New York. And, and then soon after that, I saw Wild Style. And once I saw Wild Style, um, I was hooked. And since then, I, I haven't let hip hop go. It is who I am. And one of those famous scenes of uh, the Cold Crust Brothers and Fantastic, you know, on the schoolyard, going, out, going back to back in this battle is kind of, you know, I took the energy from that and that transferred in everything I did in life. I looked at that the same way if you're on the basketball court, you imagine yourself being Magic Johnson or Michael Jordan. I imagine myself being Easy AD. Really? Wow, that's, that's, a, that's monumental. Yeah, man, I, I appreciate your reaction right there. <laughs> <laughs> but let's talk about your beginnings, man. Like when I, that's how I got hooked, wow. right? You know, through the radio and hearing this music and wanting to be a part of this world. How did you get hooked? Well, um, I, had the, I had the pleasure of um, growing up in the Bronx. I mean, I uh, just want to share. The Bronx is an incredible uh, place. Um, I think there, first of all, I think it's some water, some special water that flows through the Bronx. Because mm -hmm. if you look at the Bronx DNA, there's a lot of interesting and eclectic people who have come through the Bronx or grew up in the Bronx. So th the way I got connected to the culture of hip-hop, it was just like more of like an organic thing, DNA. There was a vibration of music that was happening in the Bronx at the time. There were, I didn't know the names of the people who were doing it at the time, but I knew that it was it was a music that was connecting to my soul and my DNA. It's like being born to be part of something. Mm -hmm. So my connection was through the vibration of the music, right? Because our parents listened to certain types of music, but the music that I was hearing from this other entity, which now we call hip hop, um, it drew me there. And um, then the different elements that, you know, the different components of the hip hop. And I didn't want to be a b-boy because I didn't, you know, I was just too, I felt that I was really too cool to get down on the ground. And dance? Uh, absolutely. Okay. I felt that. <laughs> but I knew that I, I knew that, you know, I had a good oral thing. And I could I could write rhymes and, you know, so that's, that's what I picked up. Um, and so I just started writing basic rhymes. Um, really, I would say, they would say corny rhymes presently, but those rhymes seemed like that was the greatest things that ever created. That's right. Um, and music was a big thing in our schools. Uh, we had uh, we had we had Glee Club. Um, I played trumpet. I played bongos, congos. Um, 
And so that was just another part of, of, of my soul that was being put together like a puzzle. So that's how I got involved. That's in how you got involved in it, man. You remember, remember any of those first rhymes you wrote? Absolutely. Let me hear it. Well, I mean, I wrote my first rhyme when I was like nine years old. Uh -huh. uh, and so the different components that I added to it was because I like mathematics um, and I like school. So, I mean, I wrote, it, it's, it goes like this. It goes five plus four minus seven equals two. I don't smoke any cheaper or carry bamboo. I don't drink no wine or sniff no cocaine because all it do, it messes up your brain. I just deal with life and society. My name is A.D. Harris, but they call me Easy. The E is for easy, which I am at times. The A is for authority, I have in my rhymes. And S is for school, because that's what I like. And Y is for the years I've been doing it right. So A.D., y'all, so what it be when I enter my house, I use my key. Come on, man. Bars. Wow. Bars wow. at nine. Wow. You wrote that at nine? Wow. Listen, yeah. I, I want to talk about early time, because this is the early time when you're rhyming and, and, and early days of high school, because I know in, in high school, you know, you're, you're an athlete, and, and part of that confidence is part of the confidence you put into your MC style and your MC skills. And um, there's, a, there's a picture that I believe that um, is captured of you and some of your friends um, in high school, and some of these pictures were snapped by a co uh, a, a co student of yours named Joey, and at the time he was a school photographer. So tell us about that time. All right. So, um, well, my first school, the first school I wanted to go to was Clinton, right? Because Clinton was known for their basketball history. Um, I love basketball. Um, I played basketball since I was eight years old, and I wanted to go to Clinton because my sister dated. Uh, this gentleman, his name was Anton Perkins. He played in Clinton. So my, I wanted to go to Clinton because I want they had rich basketball history. I wanted to play there. So um, my first day of school, I went to I went to uh, I went to Clinton, and I was able to walk in and walk out. I was like, this is not for me, hmm. right? There was no like no regulations, uh -huh. no rules. Like you could just go into school and come out. I was like, I went back home. I said, Mom. I don't want to go there. Let's find another school for me. And it was a lot of people, right? I like people, but it was a lot of people, like four or 5,000 students at, at Clinton. So my sister had just, they had just opened this new school called South Bronx. It was, it, um, and it was like maybe 250 students at the time. So um, I went there with my mom and they was like, well, we, he can't come here. But then we said, oh, my sister goes here. So they had a program where if you had a sibling at the school, you would automatically go there. Mm. So that's how I got into South Bronx High School. And um, I tried out for the basketball team um, at was South Bronx. Were you nice? I was, I was pretty, I would say I was pretty, I was pretty good. I mean, uh -huh. I, was a, I was a point guard, um, very, very knowledgeable about the game. I love basketball, and I thought, I thought basketball. Like, I didn't just play basketball. Uh -huh. I thought basketball, right? So I was a 10 and 10. 10 points, 10 assists. I ran the show. I directed everything, like, you know, go over here, go over there. We had an incredible team. He was a point guard. Point guard, okay. absolutely. So, you know, the point guard has that thing, right? Ego, meaning, like, ego to win, um, satisfy all the other players. Um, and because I had so much extensive knowledge about basketball and we had a coach that didn't, I really ran the show. Uh -huh. Doing practice, set up um, the press call, you know, 1-3-1, one, one, rebel, swing right, swing left. Um, and um, in our first year in competition, because um, they set up the B division, because we had a small school, and they had the A division for the larger schools. Mm -hmm. We won our, we won our, we won our, we won. won our division? Yes, we did. So wow. that was history. So that's one, another history that we did. Okay. And on our team, we had incredible players. Um, and um, I just loved basketball. Like, in school, they always say the girls are faster than the guys. Uh -huh. That's correct. Yeah. Because I remember, like, the young lady saying, well, are you going to come to my house? I said, come to your house and miss school. That's not going to happen. Uh -huh. <laughs> I come to your house, I miss school, I can't play basketball. So I was always a thinker. Like, I never was a react. I, didn't re I was re not reactionary uh -huh. at what I did. I was always a thinker. So I, I love basketball so much. And music, remember. Like, so it's, I'm, I'm. They're and, working hand in hand. It's hand in hand, time. exactly. Okay. I'm like there and, you know, crust, cold crust. We just, we're moving in the realm where people are, uh, like, start feeling our flow and our uh -huh. style. And, you know, and, you know, so that's where I was. When you talk about basketball and the correlation between basketball and music, so today we'll see LeBron James, who's very 
invested in the culture and hip hop. You see people like Iman Shumpert or Dame Dollar, you know, who actually put out music. Even Shaquille O'Neal, you know, became huge, right? Absolutely. And so, but this didn't start then. Mm -hmm. This is this this didn't start now. This started yeah. Yeah. then. And so, what time period are we talking about? I said um, seventy nine eighty. Okay. At that time, um, and I mean. Basketball and music is just love. I mean, what more could you want to do in life? Mm -hmm. Play basketball and do music. I mean, everywhere you go, you're like a celebrity. You, you go, come in the gym, right? The guys look at you and say, yo, that looks like Easy AD. That you play ball, I'll be like, you'll see. <laughs> <laughs> but that was high school, right? Mm -hmm, that's correct. So what was junior high like? Because were, oh, you, were you a member, of, you weren't a member of Cold Crush. Oh, no, not time. yet. Not okay. yet. No, no, no. I was a member, you know, I was a member of the Asalam Brothers. The Asalam okay. Brothers. Let's right. talk about so, the Asalam Brothers. Oh, you want to, okay, Asalam Brothers. So Asalam Brothers, it was myself, um, Donald D, who ended up um, being part of the Rhyme Syndicate out in L.A. with, with Ice-T. Ice yep. Uh, so me and Donald grew up in the, in the boys' club on Ho Avenue, uh, boys' and girls' club on Ho Avenue in the Bronx. Um, so we were friends since we were maybe eight years old. Um, the boys' club kind of like honed my, my, the way I look at life, um, the things, my values, um, the way that I see adults, how I function. So the boys' club gave me like stability, meaning that um, I learned to swim at the boys' club. I played basketball at the boys' club. I got my first job at the boys' club. Um, so I spent a lot of my life after went to school, elementary school, uh, went to the after school program, then went to the boys club. Um, so, um, so that's where um, we met um, DJ Rashid mm -hmm. and DJ Stephanie. Um, wow. And so they said we, we formed a group, and me and Donald was like, we MCs. Said, well, you're down. So, and then we got this other guy named Frank Nitty. Mm -hmm. Well, he, he, I don't Frank, I don't recall Frank even ever rhyming, but he was part of the MC crew. <laughs> and but me and Donald, did, we did house parties and stuff like that. Uh, Donald lived in Lambert at the time, and I lived on Vice Avenue, um, uh, 1471 Vice Avenue. Uh huh. What, what did y'all think was going to happen when y'all formed this group? Like, was the plan to just do house parties, or did you think you would make a career out of it? We didn't, we, I, I don't think we ever, like, we, we didn't know that word, number one, career. We didn't okay. know the word career. We just knew that you would be popular in your community, number one. The girls would like you a lot. Okay. Um, and um, it was just a vibration that you get, like, you would get on, the, you can tell your story when you're emceeing, like, get up there, like, you can boast and, and feel the flow. So when you come in a place, everybody's like, oh, my God, so-and-so is here. But we felt that we could be the best, right, because Rashi was like, I'm going to become better than Flash, Grandmaster Flash, mm -hmm. who is my favorite DJ of all times. Okay. Um, Over Herc? Uh, well, Herc was a different type of DJ, right? So Herc, right? so Herc was more of a DJ that played the songs, right? He played music, okay. and they played them all out. Flash was just like, he was like, what they, he was like so electric, meaning I'm a little, to me, I'm a little kid. I'm watching this, 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 this person orchestrate like instruments, music, going back and forth. I mean, I just, I was just in awe of his skill. So I didn't, I didn't, I was an MC, but my first love was a DJ. Uh huh. It felt like everybody at that time didn't do just one thing. That's true. You know what I mean? It was discovery. I think, I think at that time, a lot of, you know, you wanted to rap because you enjoyed it. You wanted to DJ because it fascinated you. You would dance because you could meet a girl, you know, but. It was the trifecta. You did them all. You might even wrote on a wall because you just was with some people who wrote on walls. And so it was so undefined. You, you wanted to figure out what you really liked and what you enjoyed the most. So with you playing a lot of basketball and then eventually going from the Asalam Brothers, how did you transfer from the Asalam Brothers to Cold Crush? All right. So um, we were scheduled to play. It was April, October 5th. Um, I don't, I think 1987, 88, whatever, 87 or 88. We were scheduled to play at the, um, at the Sparkle and the Sparkle burned down. What was that, a club out Yeah, it was yeah, a club, club. Okay. right on Jerome Avenue. 78, okay. 78. 78, it burned down. Yeah. yeah. So we were, our Salon Brothers was scheduled to play at the Sparkle mm. and it burned down. Then in December, so we just kept, that was like a big space to play at. Uh -huh. Sparkle was like a real, real big place to play at. And so then in December, New Year's, I mean, Christmas Eve, we booked the Dixie Club. Mm. 
mm. and uh, to, for us to play. But the, the, man, the guy who owned the Dixie Club called Rashid and said, oh, we're going to have to move your date uh, because another more established group wanted that date and we're going to give it to them. And that was Grandmaster Flash and the Furious. Wow. Now, backstory oh. about the Dixie Club. That's where in the movie Wild Style, you see Fantastic Five and Cold Crush battle inside the, the Dixie Club. That's in the Bronx. That's literally down the street from where uh -huh. I used to live. Yes. And uh -huh. so you could literally would walk up and go to the Dixie. And it, on film, it looked amazing. But in real life, it really wasn't was that amazing. amazing. No. And so, so, so your favorite DJ was the reason you couldn't perform at it that It gave club. us an opportunity to, to see, see them up close and personal. Uh -huh. So we got chairs and we sat at the at the rope. So one of the things a lot of people hear in rhymes and records, you know, don't go beyond the rope. So the rope was there to separate the the the, the artists from the people. Uh huh. And if you didn't have any clout or any reputation, you did not go under that rope. Because if you went under that rope, they would they would they would, they would you, you, you get you get hurt. Get Bodily hurt. Home. Okay. Bodily right, so okay. That, so that that's a serious deal. So we sat at the rope. We all night, so remember, I'm, I'm not even 13 yet. I don't remember my age, but I, I'll figure it out. Sitting in here watching Flash, it wasn't about the MCs at the time for me, it was about Flash and what he did on the turntable. It was like, then he pulled out this thing, and they call it the beatbox, the beatbox. Mm -hmm. and he was like, doo, 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 doo. I was like, oh my God, and Rashid was angry. Mm -hmm. He's like, I'm gonna be better than him. So he just went and practiced, and he kept practicing. So we, me and Donald, we started doing, like, you know, we did Lambert Center. We started doing community centers mm -hmm. like that. So we was building a, a reputation uh, for our skills. And then Rashid, Stephanie got pregnant, and Rashid said, I'm moving back to Jamaica. And that was it. That was it. So you was without a group at that point. That is correct. Okay. I'm, so. I'm, 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 I'm here. Okay. okay. So, so what was going through your mind at I, that I time? I was hurt. Uh -huh. It's like losing somebody you love. So I lost, I, I lost my, 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 my DJ, our DJ, our DJ, female and a male DJ. So Stephanie was a DJ as well. That's early on before ladies were DJing. She uh -huh. was DJing. And, and so we had nothing to do. And me and Donald went to try out uh, for Africa Islam a group uh -huh. and the Funk Machine. Mm. So we went there, we rhymed hard, came hard, and um, they didn't choose me. Okay. They chose Donald. Uh huh. And I saw this guy named Gordy B. He was like, yo, they, we chose Donald. I was like, goodness gracious, like, what's going on? <laughs> like, I'm, I'm like, I'm like lonely. Uh -huh. I'm lonely to do, do, to do hip hop. And so um, then I ran into Tony Tone. Tony, Tony Tone. Tone. So, Never leaving the girls Tony alone. Tone. Tony Tone. So you got to break down who Tony Tone is oh, man, yes. and and, um, and how that meeting happened, that first encounter with Tony Tone happened. So Tony Tone is the founder of the Cold Crush Brothers. He's the one who came up with the name. He's like what you call an owner if you in basketball terms. Mm -hmm. So Tony Tone was also part of the Brothers Disco, um, DJ Barron Breakout, and the Funky, the original and funky, funky Four. The funky uh, four. Okay. That had Raheem. K.K. Rockwell. Okay. Raheem, who eventually went to Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. Years that is later. correct. Years later. Yeah. Okay. So Tony Tone used to um, hook um, the sound system up called the Sasquatch. So in the early days of hip hop, everyone had their own sound system. So the Sasquatch was the cleanest, most pure sound that you ever want to hear. Mm -hmm. It was so dope. Like, they... It was just, it was like, the Sasquatch, like, it was big. Sound was big, the MCs, you could hear them breathe on the microphone, it was so clear. They, they had the Shure microphones, incredible. So Tony Tone was, he put that system together. And Tony Tone saw how groups would bicker mm -hmm. over little things. So he decided that he wanted to create his own group and get away from that, and he created the Cold Crush Brothers. And when I met Tony, Tony was like a super, super senior. Like, I guess he was in high school for like, like 35 years. <laughs> <laughs> so he used to come, Tony used to be in, he used to be in the cafeteria with his head down with a briefcase. And so for a couple of weeks we saw him and no one said anything to him. And then I sent this guy, his name was Charles. I sent him over there. Charles looked like the guy from the Mad Book mm -hmm. with the missing tooth. Yeah. 
So when you see Charles, you can't do anything. You're like going to smile at him. You're going to show him love. Um, so we sent Charles over there to bring Tony to the table where all the ball, where the team was. So we brought him over there, and Tony vibe, and Tony was like, "Yo, I, Tony said I'm starting my own group called Cole, and I'm naming it the Cole Chris Brothers." I said, "So I'm an MC." He said, "You're down." Just like that. That was it. You didn't have to audition or nothing. Nothing. He never heard you rap. Never. At that time, who were the other members of the group, or were you the first? It was. It was no other members of the group. It was just me. It, I was the first one he put down. He said, "But I have this Latino brother that I've, I've been watching." His name is Charlie Chase. Wow. He's with this group called Tom and Jerry. Now, back in the mm. early days of hip hop, the disco DJs played music, mm-hmm. and they get they used to give the hip hop DJ like twenty minutes for the whole evening just to play music. So Charlie Chase was that guy. Tony Tone was so masterful with his thinking that he said, "I'm not interested in being a head DJ. I want to put this guy in the forefront because I understand his talent." Mm-hmm. And that's what he did. He brought in Charlie Chase. And um, then, you know, the group changed. We had different members from different times, but we formulated the Cold Crest that they know of today. Like, they know of today, right? Yes. Who were the original members, though? Okay, so we're going to go to original members. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of saw how you did. You kind of <laughs> hop, skipped, and jumped over that there. I, I, AD, I, I didn't know I, what happened. I, obviously, my, <laughs> skill, my skills are not hitting. <laughs> so um, the original members is um, uh, DJ Tony Tone. Mm-hmm. We call he was the original DJ Tony Tone at the time, DJ Charlie Chase. Uh huh. It was um, Easy AD, Mr. T. Mr. T. Mm-hmm. Mr. T Bone, and then there was Whip a Whip and Dada Rock. Whip a Whip. Okay. All right. See. Okay. <laughs> Dada Rock. Okay. Right. See, these are names when I was a kid with that transistor radio that I was hearing. Right. And now I'm sitting next to you. Safe to say that the culture aged really well. Would you say that? I would say absolutely. I, I agree with you, one hundred percent. Yeah. So that was that was the original members, and then Whip and Whip and Dada Rock decided to go and move to move to another group that they felt that it would be more more established than us at the time. And T Bone just disappeared. What do you mean he disappeared? He just disappeared. Like he just didn't. He vanished. We didn't see him anymore. Rich so lucky because Rich was in the Bronx when all of this as a kid. This was happening. What were you doing? Like, was you, you know, aware of these people? Well, or? I, I was, and it's interesting because I come from my own little group in, mm-hmm. in the neighborhood. And, you know, as as you come up in the neighborhood young, you just want to be on the flyer with the guys. Yeah. You just want to, even if you could just get in the party, you just want to get in and let me get on the mic for a second. You know, and, and if someone say, come here, shorty, take the mic. That made your year. You mm-hmm. was like, yo, I was on the mic. Well, who? Yo, they, so, t- t- Tony Tone let me on the mic. No, he didn't. Yeah, I'm telling you, Charlie Chase was cutting. What? Yeah, Easy AD was there. You know, Dada Rock was there, or, or whoever was there. You was excited about it. So as a kid, that was our motivation. Yeah, and, to be and, like and, them. And, and then, absolutely. Uh-huh. And then, and then when you go back to school, and the girls hear the story, you already know what it is because. <laughs> You know, you that's your that's your motivation. Outside of you being good in basketball, your motivation is how am I get the girls' attention so they see you can rap. People talking about you can rap. Oh, I heard you was rapping the other night, blah blah blah. Yeah, say a rhyme for me. Then you pull it to the side. You say a little rhyme. You know, whatever it is. <laughs> You're like, oh, he's cute. He can rap. And now the word goes around the school that you can rap. So he yeah. said he said something a key point that yeah. we kind of we, we we need to talk about flyers. So flyers was what we how we promoted our shows mm-hmm. and if your name appeared on the flyer that means that you were somebody special to get your name on the flyer was a big deal yeah it didn't matter whether you was DJing MCing or doing nothing your name was on that flyer you had clout like you and so what they used to do is get people to give out flyers and they say I'll put your name on the flyer and that's how you would get on the flyer, and that would make you really a celebrity. That's correct. Right? You'd yes. become a local celebrity. Absolutely. Would you liken the flyer of back then to the Instagram post of today? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah it was. We had some very like unique flyer makers. Um, uh, we had Buddy Esquire. Mm-hmm. And again, lineature is connection. You talked about the connection, how you connected and how you got connected to the culture and, and mm-hmm. us as well. Tony Tone brought Buddy Esquire into the into the culture to do flyers. Wow. wow. Um, I'm okay. So now I'm, I'm I'm okay. Now I'm in my toy store right now. Right. At that time, see the the way that the culture migrated to the West for us. Right. Uh, 
you did have people who were doing things early on in the late 70s and the 80s in LA, but I was in the Bay, all right? And so you would hear about the LA Dream Team, Egyptian Lover, um, LA Posse, you know, a lot of people were doing incredible things um, out there at that time. I wanted to know, I couldn't tell what was more important, to be an MC, to be a b-boy, to dance, or to be a DJ. What held the most significance at that well, time? Well, if you go if you go through eras, right, everything has uh, had its importance depending okay. on the like era. So the DJ is the was at one time the most important thing. Okay. Because the DJ vibration, vibe was all about the DJ. Then it became about actually the the MC. Eh, maybe B boy came before that, right? So the okay. B boys became because it was the music. Then the B boys and B girls, right? get on the floor and like the crowd go crazy they're doing flips not flips they're doing spin legs and all that so then the MC and when the MC came into play it changed the whole vibration of the particular party and what was important the MCs there's no MC that can say they started a group mm -hmm. but DJs started groups uh huh so, so it was the DJ then it was maybe the b-boy then the MC so is there a standout MC of that time that helped catapult the importance of the MC to the front? Well, there's different levels, right? So, um, of MC, and so um, one of the first MCs documented in the culture of hip hop in history is Coco Rock. Okay. Like, what what type of MC was he? So you'd have to look down the history to see what he did, what he delivered, and how he presented himself. Mm -hmm. right? And then it started evolving where the MC became more significant. So the first MC would say, "Hey." so-and-so is in the house. And then sometimes when you're in the park, the park jams they call, we said, your mother's at the gate. So-and-so <laughs> mother is at the gate. And it's the most embarrassing thing. Your mother's at the gate. Um, so, so, so the MC would announce the next, announce the parties, announce who's in the house, and things like that. And then it became where you start rhyming. So, and that took it to a whole nother level. And then you had, um, so there was MCs like, uh, Mel, Melly, Melly Mel, Mel, okay, Melly Mel. Um, you had uh, um, Scorpio, mm -hmm. who was known as Mr. Ness at the time. Right. Mm -hmm. And we had Cowboy. Now, Cowboy to me was more a very smooth. He had like a sultry voice. Cowboy, like he was, a real he was, he was like, he was like, he was like a sex symbol mm -hmm. as far as like his voice and the way he presented himself. And then we had Creole. Kid Creole was like charismatic. He would go back and forth on the stage, and Kid Creole could rock an echo chamber. He's like, Kid Creole, Creole, solid gold. Like it was like a technique and a skill. Like people look at it as, as something small, but back then echo chamber and the flow was like incredible. And they had that, mm -hmm. so that was the group. Like those three guys, and I mean four guys, was it, man? They they set the standard at the time, and they used to play everywhere. Also, they had um, they had a gypsy MC. I would call him a gypsy because mm -hmm. a gypsy goes from group to group. Okay. They had um, Busy B. Chief Rocker. Yeah, he was a gypsy. So he would be at this group. <laughs> he'd be with that group. He would be with that group. He would be with that group. He would be with that group. And then you had um, you had um, Master Rob, Kevy Kev. Master like Rob. Master Rob had that yeah. voice, that deep voice, and like it was just incredible. And Kevin Kev was like one of the most incredible showmen at the time. Where Kevin Kev was like one of the first MCs to do things that a lot of people were doing, like in the late in the eighties, where Kev would wear American flag around his neck. Okay, he would wear like the the the, the, the racing motorcycle, motorcycle helmet. helmet. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. So Kev was like a, a inspiration, like he. He he was he he was he he, he set some stuff in fire. Kev was a sex symbol. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Was he like the first? I wouldn't say the first, first but he definitely was a sex symbol. We, you know, I mean, he yeah. was fashionable with that with, the, with that motorcycle hat. Uh -huh. When he pulled up in the jam with that motorcycle helmet on, it was just like it stopped. It was stopped because it was like the the the, um, the German one that like Schultz would wear. That, you know, mm -hmm. the half one was crazy. But you brought up something that was very important. I like, talking about the echo chamber, and so the echo chamber, from how I remember. Herc was kind of the first one to bring out the echo chamber, but it was just cool Herc. Like, cool Herc, yeah. So it was kind of like rock the house, 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 house kind of vibe. And then Creo was like, from my understanding, from my seeing, even hearing tapes, nobody rocked the echo chamber better than Creo. Mm -hmm. But Cold Crush did something where you guys backed each other up and made your vocal 
echo chamber without the echo chamber. That's correct. And 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 so explain to us a little bit about that style. So, um, it's like we so we would go like yes yes y'all yes y'all yes y'all yes y'all fresh y'all fresh y'all rock y'all rock y'all. So it was like it was like a rhythm like it was like a drum like boom 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 boom. It was like a heartbeat, and that was just like a it was like we were just backing each other up giving more power and inspiration to that particular word. And if you hear Anti Up, that's us right there. Right. Anti Up, that's, that is the Cold Crush Brothers right there. That flow is us. Mm -hmm. When I heard that, I was like, oh, that's, that's us. The MOP Anti Up? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that, that, that's Cold Crush Brothers? Yes, sir. What, 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 how many groups <laughs> would that you've heard that you've heard yourself in? Like um, MOP? I would say a lot, a lot of them, right? So I look, I look at, I look at, at hip hop as like culture and DNA, right? Yeah. And there's trees, there's seeds, right? Mm -hmm. That that's in the ground, and then the tree grows, and they get branches. So that's part of the family. So at no time, um, I want to ever be disrespectful to anyone who laid down their you know, oh, no, foundation. Yeah. yeah. So I, you look at, you look at the thing, the ones you, Jurassic Five. Jurassic Five for sure. Um, um, Run DMC. Run DMC. Uh, which is uh, the leaders of leaders the new school, of uh -huh. um, MOP, uh -huh. and and who else? And even you look at like Trap Core Quest. Trap Core Quest. Uh -huh. But if you look at even individuals, like you know, when you look at a like a, a J, uh -huh. um, and where he got his his history from is his, his man um, Jazzo, uh -huh. who was an incredible Cold Crush uh, fan, and us being in Brooklyn doing the first Red Hook Day in 1981. Okay. And if those of you who don't know what Red Hook is. If you didn't live in Red Hook, you didn't go to, you Red, didn't Hook. Go to Red Hook. <laughs> one way in, one way out. One way out, that's right. <laughs> so Red, Red, Hook, Red, Red Hook, Brooklyn was an incredible place. And so those groups, and some other people that I can't um, think of right now, but Outcast. we just. Yeah, that's Outcast. Outcast. Mob. I, yeah. I, there you go. So you helped okay. me out. That's yeah, wonderful. Yeah, no, but this is what I could you Because even like yeah. Shake, 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 um, Shake the Camera, shake it like that sounds like Roy punk rock rap. rap. Yeah. Sounds just like punk rock rap. So, I mean, I, we're honored, right? We look at that as like, that's an incredible thing, right? You injected something into the world, and now people are taking parts of it and making it, you know, better. Mm -hmm. Will you will, will you look at an outcast because that that song became a huge hit? I believe that album went diamond, yes. right? And and they got to, rightfully so. This is not a knock on them. I'm happy for them. Those are my brothers. We helped break their music in Northern California at a time when no one was playing Southern playlistic Cadillac music. We were playing their music because they were from the South, so you, at that time you couldn't really get play on the East Coast because you weren't from the East, mm -hmm. and so we, you know, we really received them open arms. They had a lot of success. You guys weren't able to reap the benefits financially of the success that others have that have your DNA in their in their career and their music and they in their creative. Would you trade that? You know your history for the fame and success. Absolutely. For the finance. Absolutely not. I would never. Economics and money is just um, n not that big of a deal for me. Okay. I think history is one of the most important things to me. Um, it will always be important to me, and um, I would always go with the history. I mean, other members in my group would not feel the same way that I feel. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. Well. <laughs> but I think that like history is is so significant on many different levels. Um, and it, it's ever giving. It mm -hmm. never goes away. Like history is, it's like, it's there. I love history. I think like the things that we've done in, 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 in our culture and when you're doing it, you don't, you don't really like know you're doing it. Yeah. Right. You're just doing it. You're just flowing. I just like what we did as far as our flow, our style, we changed the way you could be an MC. Yes. And, and an MC group. Mm -hmm. Right, so you look at the Cold Crush Brothers, right? You have two DJs, four MC, and you have four super intelligent brothers, right? That all have a specialty, and when you put that together, it's like it's like it's like it's like neutrons and electrons and atoms. You bring mm -hmm. it together, and it's an explosion um, beyond like anything you can, anything that you can conceive. So we look at it that way. So one of the things that we did, and what we did as far as our group is concerned, we didn't want to be popcorn. Yeah, we didn't want to be corny, so we would take a song like um, Harry Chafin, "Cast in the Cradle" and "The Silver Spoon," "Little Boy Blue and the Man on the Moon," you know, and, and we would take that melody, 
and write a rhyme, a routine to it. Now, in our lifetime, we had, we had of course, one of the most prolific MCs on the planet. I mean, I mean, he, he was born to MC, mm -hmm. Grandmaster Gad. That's, that's what he is. <laughs> so, family. right, sitting yeah. in the room, and we just like, we all giving out whatever our pieces and stuff like that, and he, he masterfully putting it together. And we came out with other MCs can't deal with us, and we used Rocket in the Pocket. Mm -hmm. That like blew people mind. Like it blew your. They blew. They was like, what? What? Like it was like they have. They was having a mental orgasm when they heard that. Like, what's that? So that changed how you how you could be an MC. Mm -hmm. Like you could not just take something off television and write a rhyme to it. Like, no disrespect. Or, no, I'm not, I'm not gonna. I, I, I take that back. To give you a a better understanding, like the Force MDs. Okay. They were the Force MCs. Like they did like. We are for some D's. Now, we just thought that was really corny. It was just, it was like, it too was like, simple. it was oh. too simple, right? Okay. It was too simple. Um, and that was it. So we would create something like Gigantor. Oh. The cold crust, the cold crust, the cold crust. <laughs> Everybody, everybody, the cold crust. Four MCs. The cold crust. That went rocking to your knees. The cold. Come on, man. So Ooh. that's what we we take the and we was like power. Like it was like you building a power to explode. And every time we we, we would rehearse, we're sitting in the room. It was like being in like a think tank. Mm -hmm. Well, I can only imagine that. But you have to be proud of. Like impact is important. You you may not get the royalties, but <laughs> you made the impact. How proud of you of you know? Like we, we're in 2022 for it, and we're having a conversation about the Cold Crush Brothers and all these different artists that have been impacted by what you guys brought to the game. How important is that to you? I mean, it's number one is is it's, it's super honorable, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it humbles you understanding that your 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 plight and your and the world is not over, meaning mm -hmm. like you have so much more to give. That was one section of your life. You gave that information. You gave information that changed the vibration of the entire world, not just your borough, mm -hmm. not your city, but the entire world. And it's just good. It, it's good to know that. I mean, what else could you ask for? I mean, people live every day and they don't contribute anything to 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 the world. Mm -hmm. And we lived. We're living and still living, and we're still contributing things in the world. And that's just one section, which is a major section. And I'm just honored. I'm honored, and we're honored, I'm sure, to to be part of that. You know, it's funny because you guys have always been ahead of your time. And, and I'm going to tell this story, and I know you might not want me to tell this story. But I, I, I growing up, I lived in a neighborhood in the South Bronx. And you guys were, you know, as far as we were concerned, megastars and you hadn't recorded a record as of yet. And, but you guys still had business. You had your own parties that you did. Um, you even had posters. And there was a girl that you used to date that lived on my block <laughs> that had a poster of you. Mm. And this girl would walk around with this poster and brag and go, you know who my man is? And she would pull out the poster and open it up. And I'll go, easy AD? You, yeah, that's you. And she's like, yeah. And then she would roll up the poster and then take it back upstairs in the house. And I'm like, how does this guy have a poster? It was poster pimping you. Yo, it was crazy. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm like, how does he have a poster? And, and it was like, they had posters. So it's like, what even made you made you think to even print posters at this stage? I, I would tell you, like, one of the things that I I love history. So. I wanted to make sure, number one, we had a photographer that would come to all of my shows and take pictures because I wanted to make sure I had pictures of my history. This is me right. being selfish. Now, Elvis Moreno, who is the original tape master, so you, they may call it mixtape now, but he's the original tape master. Mm -hmm. He sold our tapes. So we didn't talk about the tapes yet. Oh, we mm -hmm. got to get to that. Right? But we had this guy named Larry. Now, I knew, we knew Larry, and Larry used to have said, I'm going to take a picture and I'm gonna blow it up into posters. Cause we want to, every time we had a show, we wanted to give out 50 photographs and 50 posters. Mm -hmm. So our audience knew, they knew, they can recognize us visually because some people couldn't come to our shows, they could only hear it on tape. Right. So visual was important to me. So we used to give out posters, mm. 
and, and pictures. Mm -hmm. And so, because I was considered a very handsome young man, at no, the, still are, man. Well, well you know, know what I mean. Well, let me, let me just set I mean, the record straight. Mean. He was the sex symbol of the group. Okay. Let's just let, I'm gonna just call a spade a spade. You was the sex symbol what? of the group. But you, you, you even wanted your hair as long as mine. Right. He had long braids. The mm -hmm. girls wanted. They were screaming. A D. It was, it was, it was like, it was fantastic. Yeah. It, was, it was crazy. You said it was, it was crazy. crazy. It was crazy. It was, it was crazy. crazy. I mean, yeah, I mean, I didn't want to, I didn't want to go there. Because, I mean, I had to because I, I mean, we wanted to, I'm at the party. We trying to open for y'all and I'm watching the girls. I'm like, we, we going to open for them. Like, y'all going to open for them? Like, yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it was incredible. Crazy. So, I mean. You were Drake. Back I mean, then. honestly, I mean, honestly, I would tell you this, man. It was, it was <laughs> incredible. Like the energy that you get, like to be able to have that power, right? At such a young age. Right, yeah, that's and you can just kiss. You can kiss. I mean, I I remember we played somewhere, and and, and this girl ran up and said, "I kissed her." She just fell out. Like, she passed dude, out. Passed out, dude. It? Like passed out. Now this is before it's records. Really, really so passed bad. out, this man. Is real. This, 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 this is real. This is real. This is real. This You got no, pictures. No, with the photographer. No, the photographer wasn't there. <laughs> but the interesting thing that we everybody can back the story because if we, she fell out, she fell out. Oh, boom! Hit the floor, and then. So the crowd started moving because her man was there. Uh -huh. And as he approached the stage, our security team said, dude, don't take another step. You don't want to do that. So what they did is at the end of the show, they took me into the room like I'm the president of the United States. Two, go two guys outside. They took everybody upstairs and got them in the limousine and everything. Then they came and got me and threw me in the car and then we drove off the thing. I mean, that was so incredible. I was like, what like is this what it's all about? And then one time we played in um, in in in, in a roller skating ring in in Brooklyn. We walked in. I was, I just felt that I had to be very professional, mm -hmm. right? I was just it was important for me to not talk to the audience before we perform. So I used to always go in straight to the dresser to the to the dressing room. So we come in. We have maybe four or five security people with us, and they're not really, they call them security, it was family that protected us. And we didn't know, we, don't, we didn't use the word security, it was mm -hmm, family. Mm -hmm. So we walk in, and then the girls turn around, they go, I was him! So they just run. <laughs> they, they come, and they start pulling my hair, they grabbing my, my jacket, you know, pulling my, my private parts, and I'm just standing there, and everything hurts. And I'm like, can you let my hair go? You don't have to do this. Like, I didn't know that it could be pain as well. Yeah. yeah. And so, I mean, I used that to my advantage. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as a young man, you super ego having that power because that's a lot of power, and sometimes it can be abusive. But I mean, I was, you know, me and Kevin Kev actually looked like brothers, mm -hmm. right? Sure. So, so when they saw Kev, they saw me. It's like, yo, is Kev your brother? Kev looked at me and said, yeah, that's my brother. That's my brother. So, I mean, that was a big deal. That was a big, a big deal. deal back then. I mean, like the girls are you young out. at this time. Right? I was young. I wasn't even 18 yet. Oh, it's yeah. it's it's interesting. But yeah. but quickly, let's talk about some of these Cold Crush tapes. Oh yeah, and Tape it. Master because you know I joke about this, but in New York City, at that time, if you didn't have a fight over a Cold Crush tape, you really wasn't in the hip hop mm -hmm. because you had a fight over this tape because somebody would either take your tape, pop your tape, sneak thief your tape. Or, or 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 something with your cold crush tape, and it would always be a problem. Like it would be a, like, yo, where's my tape at? Where's my? Co <laughs> oh, I, I dubbed it, and then my system popped it by accident. Fight popped off every time, yeah. and and the only place you can get the tapes if you wasn't at the jam was from Tape Master, who had a spot over on Tremont, mm -hmm. up on the on the side of the hill, and it wasn't really a nice neighborhood to go get in the, the flea market. In the little, it was it was tough over there, mm -hmm. you know. And so you would go and tell your friends come with you, and y'all would all go. You only buying one tape, mm -hmm. but all of y'all going together. It might be six people to go buy one tape. So, again, history is important to me. El Elvis Moreno, who's the original tape master, was my friend in fourth grade. How I met him, he walked to the classroom and, and he's like he was chunky, so the so the students started like teasing him. I was like, leave him alone, stop. Mm -hmm. That was just it, and we were friends from that point on. But the interesting thing about the tapes is the tapes went from the Bronx to Brooklyn, to Queens, Staten Island, and then out, out, of, out, of, out of Barrow. Then it went out of the country because people were sending their tapes 
our tapes to the family that was in the army, Germany, Japan. Mm -hmm. So we had like tapes all over the world. This is before records. Mm -hmm. This so, was before the internet. That's that's correct. Okay. Right. Right. And so, yeah, and people were like, oh my god. So our um, brand was big all over the planet just because of the tape master. And those tapes were like $20 in 1980, 81. They were $20. That's, that's a lot of that's money. a lot of money in 80, 81. That's right? why I said it's six people. But I want to go back to the tapes because I like to kind of make the correlation so folks will understand when we talk about how the culture aged really well and it adjusts right? You adjust with the times. It's almost like evolution. It evolves. So what we know now as the internet, really, that's what the tape was for us. That's how the information got worldwide and people could listen to the same thing simultaneously in Japan and France that they're hearing in New York and Cali. Mm -hmm. So that was important. Did you expect, well, how much of the $20 fee did y'all get? Not, nothing. So it wasn't about, again, it wasn't about money, okay. right? So, because he was our, he was my friend, right? I used to be at his house all the time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I had a different relationship with him than the other members. Um, it wasn't about the money. It was it was just like, you was part of the family. That was your thing. You did your thing. But how, but how many tapes might he sell? He sell a lot because I've that been with this, him. Yeah. I've been with him where we go to like Forty Second Street and he, and he have twenty tapes and they all they already purchased. We walk in, sit down, people just come in, and no, we wasn't, it wasn't, we didn't look at economics that way. It wasn't about money. It oh, wasn't. That's crazy to me. That's but, yeah. but About the tapes, though. Yeah, the tapes. We had him plug in directly to the system. That's why our tapes were so clear. So one of the things that was different between our tapes and other people's tapes, that they tapes had static on it. You hear a lot of shh. Oh, okay. Because people would take the radio and go to the jam and put the radio in front of the speaker and press record. Right. And that's how they got the tape. So you would hear, no distortion. Our, our tapes was clear. You can make 20 copies of it. It's clear. And that was, that was important to me. Like, I don't know why, but it was important to me at the time. And there was a car called OJ, right? And OJ, it was a cab company, OJ. You put OJ on hold. For just forty dollars for the entire day, they take you everywhere. So, when you get into OJ, whoever was hot, they had your tape in there. Now, the only uh, tapes, the only tapes that I ever, I don't, Rich, you may know, the only tapes that I ever heard in in the OJ car was Flash and the Furious, mm -hmm. or the Furious and Cold Crush. I've never heard. Not, I'm not saying that it didn't happen, but I've never heard any other group's tapes in the OJ. Now. He's, he explained to you, you could be playing ball, full court. You know how you play outside in the summer. Yeah. Your radio is down here. You got a cold crush tape in there. You go down, take a shot. You come back, your tape is gone. Nobody knows where it is. It's gone. Wow. It was like gold. Yeah. It was gold. It yeah. was. No, the, tape, the, tapes, the tape thing was like, you would see friendships break up over tapes. Yep. You would see people get jumped over a tape. Yep. Mm -hmm. Like literally fist fights over a tape. Yep. And you're like, yo, where's my tape at? And as soon as you start up, bang! Like, like, like it's a fight. It's a fight. You like what happened? It's like because because that tape. First of all, even to have that tape meant you was cool because yep. everybody couldn't get a tape because once again it was twenty dollars a tape. So who's spending day twenty dollars back in nineteen eighty one on a tape? On a tape, right? You could buy some sneakers. Not for a record. Dollars? Yeah, you get pro cash for like eighteen bucks. That's right. He said pro cash. Okay. I ain't mad at that. Did y'all, how did y'all record? Like nowadays, with, you know, I've done tapes, me and my partner King Tech, and we would just aggregate music from different people and mix it and that sort of thing. How did y'all record your tapes? Were y'all with him? Well, we, he, he actually, he came to all of our shows. Okay. So he would plug into the system. Uh -huh. He would buy the tape. So when the show started, he'd press record and play, record the, the whole show, and then like, then make duplicates of it. So he was with us every time. Um, and I mean, it's like I'm sitting here and you're like, you're, I'm sharing this information. It's incredible. Like, I don't take time to think about this yeah. stuff. It's, yeah. it's like you're bringing a whole other world uh, out of me uh, that is incredible, man. It's like, we did all that. Y'all did all of that, man. And, and then now let's see how, since we talk about the tapes, because as you're talking, I'm thinking about when I first heard the famous battle. Oh, the battle. 
It was on the tape. You talking about the battle? The battle. <laughs> you ain't, are you talking about the battle? Harlem World. <laughs> okay. July 3rd. 1981. Oh, man. We're going to talk about it. My birthday. It is? the 3rd of July. It is? Oh, okay. Well, man, stop playing. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. It's, the, you want to listen. The battle was, it was the battle for hip hop supremacy. Uh huh. They were groups making records, so they was they they moved on. They were doing a lot of touring. The texture of being an MC changed. Okay. So we there had a go. we had a flow. Mm -hmm. The Fantastic Five have a flow, and they actually thought they were better than us. Mm -hmm. Right. So, let me give you a little idea of who we are. We never wanted to be better than any other group. We always wanted to be better than ourselves. So we never battled a group, really. We've mm -hmm. always battled ourselves. So Fantastic Five felt they were better than us. We knew who we were. Ray Chandler, who uh, managed Grandmaster Flash in the first five, he put that together. So it was when it takes all, $1,000. That was in 1981, so that would be equivalent to maybe like twenty thousand dollars now. Mm -hmm. It was a big deal. We rehearsed a lot. Like how for how long before the battle? Um, maybe like three, four months. Wow. How many days a week? Uh, maybe five, six days a week. Did anybody ever miss a rehearsal? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I tell you, Sway, I'm a man. I, I, I love I love to rehearse because I think that when you practice and you rehearse. You perfect your craft. Yeah. Right? And also, I call it muscle memory. Mm -hmm. It's easy to remember stuff when you rehearse it. We had rehearsal. I mean, I, I was at rehearsal a lot of times by myself. Because I'm a, I, when I make a commitment to something, yeah. I'm near 150%. I mean, we eventually got it all together. But I was there a lot of times by myself. But but when we did rehearse, it was just like incredible. It was, it was undescribable. It was like having your best dinner uh -huh. every time. That's what I would describe rehearsal that way. So, oh, I'm sorry, Michelle. I, I'm just yeah, yeah. Because I'm thinking they're rehearsing four min, four months before this battle. Now, you know, uh, to have to think about this, which you know is going to be the most, the biggest milestone in your career to date, for four months. Like, how did you? How did you deal with the anxiety? We didn't have any anxiety. I would say this: we knew what we was capable of. Okay. They didn't. Okay. Right. We knew our style, our flow, the way that we put things together was like no other. We knew, like, how, what we were going to do. We knew, like, we we're going to put this room routine here. It was just, for us, it was getting Charlie Chase accoladed to the right, you know, how to throw in the right uh, song and this and that. So that's what it was. And then one time we were rehearsing and Kevin, Rob, and them came outside the window. To, oh, really? Word Kind of like a boxer coming Word, to the gym? Exactly. Trying to harass Talking you? Talking about, yo, we're going to take y'all, we're going to rock y'all, y'all ain't all this, y'all ain't all that, you know? And we just was like, yo, get out of here, man, you know? You know, the Kaz, and, Kaz and JDL was like, you know, engaged. I'm not, I don't, I'm not an arguer. But did it come to fists? Like, no, we I'm never, a... we, we had too much respect for each other. Okay. To want to wanna fight. That what it was about your lyrical and your performance skills. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about who could fight. We, that was that's what it was not about. It was about your lyrical skills, how you perform. Let the crowd be the judge. Now speaking of the crowd, let's talk about the location of the battle because oh. you guys are from the Bronx and the, and the battle was not in the Bronx. So let's talk about the location. Okay. How did the location get chosen? Well, because Harlem World um, Entertainment Complex is on 116th Street and Lenox Avenue, um, and Ray Chandler, who was a great promoter, they had access to different places. And they felt that that would be the place to house this battle because it because we were our brand was growing really big, and I guess he figured like that would be the place that could hold it. Also, um, it was like a, a, a great place to have it because the number two and three train runs on 116th Street. So whether you're in the Bronx, whether you're in Brooklyn, you can get there safely. And it was amazing how every time we had a show at Harlem World, it was it was ten thousand people there. Nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine was from Brooklyn. Now, wow. did you guys ever feel that maybe it was unfair because some of the members of Fantastic Five had lineage of Harlem? And because you guys traveled to everywhere, you, right. you never really battled in the Bronx. You battled in Harlem. You battled the foursome season in New Jersey. Oh no, we did. Well, um, well, let me just clarify that. Sorry. Okay. 
There was no battle with the Force of Deeds. That was a promotional party put on the flyer so we can draw people there. We got on, we, we was playing with, we had four shows that night. Um, Damn, four in one night? Yes, yes. Four in one night. Wow. And uh, so we got there first because that was the most, you know, uh, you know, we got there, we performed, we left. Then later on, we heard the tape. And they said it was a battle. They said it was a battle. There was no battle because if we battled them, um, they probably wouldn't be. Um, <laughs> well, they 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 would they would be singing like they do. No, now. I understand. I understand. You know, I, I mean, a real battle where we had an opportunity to show our skills, yeah. and it wasn't a real battle. It was just our promoter Armstrong set that up. Oh, right, Armstrong. I understand. Right. Just for hi historical purposes, Armstrong would probably be the beginning of what you call the, the shady promoter. The sh <laughs> <laughs> well, he, he was, Armstrong. You gonna give him that title? That's uh, but, but, he, maybe he <laughs> might be shady. To you, but he was never. Well, no, shady I mean, with he couldn't be shady with y'all because right. you know. But I'm just from from what the history stories of people say. You know, you know, they've they've done gigs and it didn't pan out the way they thought it was going to pan out. No disrespect to Mr. Armstrong. You know, just you know. Okay. So Harlem World was a, 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 on 116th Street, right across from the Sabad Center, mm -hmm. Mox Number Seven. Yep. Incredible location. It could hold maybe five, six thousand people. It had three floors. Incredible stage. It was the perfect place to be there. And on the flyer, it was us battling the Fantastic Five with Grand Wizard Theodore, because uh -huh. there was a DJ. What's up, Grand Wizard Theodore? And then they had Flash was the main DJ for that particular evening. And um, we, put, we, we put together, we went and we got suits. They were tan and white, um, gangster suits. I had the guns too, right? Machine, um, we call them lyrical machine guns. We put together a show called Gangster Chronicles. And um, you don't hear it on the tape, but at the beginning of the show, we had we had smoke. We came. We had a, a, a dummy come out. We had Fantastic Five written on it, and we shot him up and <laughs> and threw him on the stomped him on the stage. Oh, I never heard right? That. Didn't hear that. That's right. <laughs> I've never that's really. Right. right. That's correct. Shot him up, stomped him out, and threw him, and then we went into our show. <laughs> Yo, that's hilarious. So, who else was there in the crowd? Like, what what other? Artists. Oh, we don't. I don't. Honestly, I would say, way I have no idea, because we were focused on doing that thing. So it was like being in a tunnel, right? You don't know. You can't see outside the tunnel. Uh -huh. It's like here. You go in, boom, and you rock it. So that's what we did. We went on first that time, and we never went on first ever again. Uh huh. <laughs> so the the story goes that it was um, the crowd would select the winner, that's right? Cool. And in that space. The crowd gave Fantastic Five the edge, which brings us back to the tape. Mm. The importance of the tape, right? Evidence. That's correct. Yeah, so the tape was evidence of that evening, and when it began to circulate, the broader crowd, the greater crowd, chose Cold Crush. That's correct. It, it, it was incredible, right? So that night when we, when the crowd, I like the way you say it, chose fantastic it was so painful yeah like I've never felt that pain ever again in my life it was it was like somebody ripped every organ outside of my body mm. I was like how is that it's possible went home laid down I was it was so hurtful so they were like bit they was basking in their in, in, the, in their victory <laughs> was they rubbing in your face well, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it's like, oh, look at them now, look at them now. I don't want to say that. I'm like, they're like, impossible. But so the ne our next show was at the Savoy Manor. It was on July 17th. Um, so that was July 3rd. We already was booked for our next show. It was, uh, it was Grandma's Flash and the Furious Five. It was uh, Cole Chris Bubbles. It was um, Curtis Blow and, and Jimmy Spicer, I think. Jimmy so. Spicer. Right, so we were, we, Super were, we were moving in, we were moving to that next, the next level. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time, the, sh the tape was like festering and people was like, um, they, didn't, they didn't win. Mm -hmm. So the people spoke, it's like the people said, said, said it, and that was the end, unfortunately that was the end of them. Meaning like they could not, they, uh, they could not pack a show or anything by themselves. Really? Yep. They, their brand went down like really low at that particular time. And our brand s soared like 
out of this world. Like we was doing shows by ourselves. Uh huh. Packing like five, six, seven hundred people in a gym. And this is all in the tri-state area. We we right exactly. Okay. It was all in all the five boroughs. Okay. The and five. then we started going out. We went out to Springfield. We uh -huh. went out to um, uh, Amityville. We went. So we started. And that's where people like Biz Markey saw us out in Long Island, mm -hmm. and for the first time and stuff like mm -hmm. that. We saw Shirley Long Island. We went out there, and our brand just got bigger. And so we we got to a point where when New Edition came out with Candy Girl, mm -hmm. when they promoted, when they brought them to New York City, and that was huge. That's they a... they opened up for us. New Edition opened up for you guys. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And we say that because they wanted to teach them. Or show them how you know a established group and how the performance. So yeah, we play with them on a lot of locations around around the city. I can see that though, because you guys' stage show, your stage performance, from what I would see, right, was um, I, I don't know if theatrical is the right word, but it wasn't just a it wasn't just rappers standing in one spot, you know, holding their crotch, you know. Mm -hmm. And and New Edition has always been about the routines and stuff. I always. Uh, I always have associated it with like the early R&B bands like the Temptations yes. and the Jacksons and all that. Mm -hmm. But Michael Bivens, to me, was like the Jam Master J of New Edition. That's correct. Right? Absolutely. Okay. And so he was always in tune with what was going on in the streets and he would incorporate that. Did you see any of y'all DNA in their performances? Well, I mean, you know, I, I, I would say this. New Edition is one of the most incredible performing groups ever their precision the way they the way they work together is incredible like they they put time in their craft that most people don't even care about mm -hmm. so I would I would say I would I would like to say some of our DNA is in there um, um, but I couldn't say that like you know but I, I never looked at them that closely to see if that was the case, but okay. you know, yeah. so so what year? So we're now we're in eighty one, eighty two, right? Mm -hmm. um, I remember Flash Dance came out. What was that like? Well, now we're that, getting like toward, That's eighty three. We're getting toward Wild Style. Wild Style, okay. So Wild Style, uh, I mean, it's just a credible piece of history as it is because a lot of these movies like Style Wars and Wild Style. And then eventually Beat Street, Breaking, you know, they were like billboards for the culture. You know what I mean? These were like flash, these are like marquee signs for everybody to see, you know, introduced it to the world, which helped artists like yourselves, right? So how did y'all first get approached about Wild Style? Well, I mean, Charlie Ahern uh, wanted to create a movie, him and um, a gentleman by the name of uh, Fab Five Freddy. Okay. Um, into, like, introduced, like, what hip hop was to the world. And so they came and they wanted to get the people who were doing hip hop to be involved in in the film. So um, that's how we got involved. He approached us, He we got our contracts, um, and uh, we still get we still get royalties from that movie to today. To this day. They're very, 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 they're very minimal, but that's not, that's not the reason, it's just, it's symbolic, right? You, mm -hmm. you do some work and you're still getting some. So it's really wonderful. But the movie Wild Style um, depicted the actual people who were doing hip hop at that time. So if you see the people who, and the people who were hot, who was really in it at the time. So earlier you had said that we were in the schoolyard, but we were actually in a park when we did the battle with other fantastic. Oh, okay. So. It was a a park where you know they like you know they have basketball courts and stuff like that. Okay. And um, so we did that battle, which was later used in a Sprite commercial, um, right. in a few, you know with Tim uh, Duncan and Kobe and all that, uh -huh. and, and, and that was kind of cool. They did kind of do that, yeah. 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 So um, Charlie Ahern and Fat Fry, they wanted to create you know bring that culture to the world, and they did that by getting the people who were doing that. They brought all the elements. Not just the MCs, they brought the B-Boys, mm -hmm. they brought the graffiti, the DJs, and the MCs. So that's one movie where you get, it may not be super entertaining for most people, but if you want to understand the culture of hip-hop, you can look at that movie. And the interesting thing about that movie, my brother at the end, his name is, you might know him as D, 
XT. Uh huh. So he's scratching at the end of Wild Style. Like people, like I'm, I love history. He's scratching. So people may think it may be another DJ, but that's DXT scratching at that's the DXT. end. That's DXT. At the end of Wild Style, transforming on the turntable, which is incredible. So this is 1983, and at the end of the film, he's cutting good times, and he's chopping it so advanced that if you go and look at it now, those same cuts are what guys are doing now. Yeah. And it was so crazy because people were saying, who the, who is that DJ? Mm -hmm. And the camera guy was trying to keep going his face. He said, get off my face, stay on my hands. Mm -hmm. And he told the camera guy to stay on his hands because he wanted people to see what he was doing, not his face. He said, it was not about what he looked like. He said, get, keep on my hands. And if you look, you could see him. <laughs> and, and it's just the way he's, it's just phenomenal. So I'm into vibration, man. That, that, that like elevated like another world. I mean, shooting Wild Style, you know, fantastic. And us, we really wasn't vibing with each other. Um, and also, like, the soundtrack that they used, we were like, this music is too slow. Yeah. <laughs> like, what it would, but when it was original soundtrack for the movie, so, you know, we didn't understand, like, you know, like, what. You couldn't use other people's music. Well, you could use other people's music. You wouldn't be sued at that time, but we didn't yeah. know that. Um, so the Wild Star movie just put, it propelled hip-hop. It opened the world up to see what hip-hop was about. Yeah. Right? And it took us to tour Japan. Uh -huh. I went to Japan for, I think, 17 days. So we brought the entire culture of hip-hop to Japan. And till this day, it's, 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 it's immersed in their culture. Absolutely. Absolutely. I got to ask you this because the, at the, I want to say towards the end of Wild Style, and I'm just going off of memory. Well, first, let me ask you this. How many takes did it take for y'all to shoot that battle scene? Uh, I think it was maybe one. Y'all did it one take? I think so. Uh, maybe maybe one of the DJs might have messed up their line, you know. Okay. But I think it took maybe one or two. Yeah, one we or didn't, two we didn't, yeah we didn't, that was really easy. Okay. Really easy. Uh, I want to say, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Ramel Z, Ramel Z, yeah. Ramel Z mm -hmm. and K Rob, right? Was it K Rob? I don't remember that person's name. Yeah, right. K Rob, they were in it. Ramel Z had the illest voice. He <laughs> did. We did. We was like, who knows that? Yeah. <laughs> we yeah. was like, who yeah. knows that? Oh, well, I'm rolling, I'm rolling, and I'm and I'm like, all right. Y'all didn't, didn't like that. I mean, I didn't say I didn't like it. I was always like, who the hell is okay, it? Okay, I won't put that vibration on it. <laughs> <laughs> it, <didn't, laughs> it was it was different, right? It was yeah. like a guy who wasn't rhyming on time. He was saying things like like he was in another planet. Uh -huh. You know what I'm saying? But it was different. That's all it was. Like we, one of the things about I say the Coker's brothers, we like different. Okay. Like if it's if it's the same, then it's boring. Mm -hmm. Like everybody's talking about um, on the microphone. Yo, what's up? And I'm feeling like this, and then I'm doing. We're like, no, no, we're oh, no, no. you know we're gonna bring a little melody in there, slice it up. Green mean go and red mean stop. Right. right. Okay. Well, I like the different. So let's talk about punk rock rap because because oh. that was different and that's kind of coming in the same lineage right after Wild Style and. But what 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 promoted or, or prompted that? Rock. So Almighty KG, we call him the tune creator. We were we had just finished a show in Yonkers and we was on the hill just vibing outside. It was warm, and KG kept saying, "Yo, we should do a record called Punk Rap, 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 rap Punk Rap." He's like, "KG, that sounds dope." But I was fighting for Fresh Wild Flying Ball. Mm -hmm. at that time and remember I'm the lonely voice in the room <laughs> and it seemed like I was the lonely voice on many different things uh -huh. um, and it was like no so we decided to do punk rock rap now the reason why we did punk rock rap because we, it connected the downtown scene the punk rock with hip hop which at that time we felt both cultures were, was rebellious right? mm -hmm. so that's what it was and we just wanted to like we like you know introduce that to, to the hip hop world now the punk rock rap song, um, just for historical purposes, was licensed by Epic Records and it was all through the UK and it was very popular in, in Europe. Did you guys ever go over to to perform any of the stuff in Europe with the popularity? Absolutely not. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> because um, a lot of in a, I mean I'm, I'm, I'm going to make sure I'm sitting right for this one. Okay. 
In a group, you have members who m made some difficult to wrong choices, mm -hmm. and they were not able to leave uh, the country. Uh, legally. Right. Okay, I like how you put that. Yeah. You, you, yeah. Then you looked at me to finish it. I saw what you did, right? <laughs> you, you, you wanted me to finish it. Okay, so y'all couldn't leave, you couldn't leave, the, you couldn't leave the country, so. Collect together. Together. Yeah. Did that hurt y'all as a group? It, I think it, it hurt us as a group from um, economics, uh -huh. why, but not from a historical um, standpoint, meaning because we're like a myth mm -hmm. to a lot of people True. all over the world. Like, when, if you don't know the cold course, they people say you don't know hip hop. Mm -hmm. A lot of groups are out there that won a lot of awards, they, a lot of accolades, but even in their, in their, in their, in their, in their evolution, they say, people say to them, if you don't know Coke, you don't know hip hop, you don't know the Cold Crush Brothers. Mm. So even when, when, um, when Hova dropped, I'm overcharging for what they did to the Cold Crush, it's, it's, everybody went in the frenzy, a frenzy. Like, oh my mm. God, what, 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 oh, you mentioned your name on the record. Did you get paid? I said, do that. And I said this to them. I said, do people get paid when people mention the name on records? <laughs> yeah, that's a good <laughs> ass point, huh? Shoot, I'll be rich. Right, exactly. <laughs> I'm just, I was a stunt joke. I'm joking. <laughs> so, so, no. so it was interesting in that, and like the one who they considered like at the top of the pinnacle at the time decided to add you and and, and what, I, what did they do, right? They took pieces of us and they never came back to, um, to, to give us any economic um, like money. Yeah. Right, economics in that respect. I'm going to just be clear. I want to make sure I say this properly. Um, Hip-hop is one of the genre of music that the younger generation and the older generation don't, um, don't mesh. Yeah. Right? So in rock and roll, you have guys who laid the foundation for rock and roll, and the guys who do rock come back and make sure that these, the older gentlemen or older artists get also involved, economically you know, paid from, from what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And hip-hop doesn't... Hip hop artists don't do that because we have a culturally disconnect between the elders, which a lot of elders are very bitter. Let's, yeah. let's be realistic. I okay. mean, you, you, I'm sure you, you ran into them. Yeah. yeah. Right? I have nothing to be bitter about personally. I look at the younger artists in hip hop as um, like family, right? It's like you have a baby, you give them the information, and then they go out there and live their life. Mm -hmm. You can't control them, you can't control what they do. You don't have to like what they do, but you should understand what they do. Mm -hmm. So that's what. And they don't owe you nothing. They don't owe you anything. Right? Not at all. They don't owe me anything. Uh huh. Not at all. Uh, so let's 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 move up. So what what happened to Cold Crush? When did Cold Crush disband? Well, you know, I don't ever think that we disband. I would well, say yes. Before we go to disband, I want to get to one more record before we go to disband, uh -huh. before we go to, to the, that evolution, because uh -huh. this song is a very important song before we get there. Um, Fresh, Wild, Fly, and Bold. Bam. Now this song, it's, first of all, this song is on three different labels. Yes. This song is on Tough City, Profile, uh -huh. and Smoking Records. Mm -hmm. uh, and, this is, and it's three different years. Mm -hmm. so, so please, uh, talk to me, uh, talk to us about that. Well. Um, let's talk about the record business. Okay. okay. Right? So un <laughs> there's a very unfortunate, like, scenario in our lives as being brown people on this planet mm -hmm. where you don't have access to lawyers and things like that. Right? So that happened to us. Um, so Aaron Fuchs, who um, was sent to us by Africa Bambata, uh, and, you know, and we signed with him. He um, he put out Fresh Wild Flying Bow. It was on profile. It came out. Um, it sold sixteen thousand units in one week. That was a big deal. Mm -hmm. So, Corey, I think Corey, is that Corey Robert? Mm -hmm. Corey, Robert. Corey and, and and Aaron couldn't get it together. So he moved to he moved to take it off the, off that label to put it on another label. Wow. And then it went from that label to the other label. Um, so Fresh Wild Flying Bow was one of the most, the records that kind of represented who we really was. Okay. Meaning our style, um, our our characters, 
and who we were. That beat was left in a drum machine before we put it out. Wow. And then Russ, Russell Simmons used that beat on Cold Rock. Cold Rock stuff. The same beat. Wow. And what, did he, what did he use it for? Cold Rock stuff. Cold Rock okay. stuff. Where he's, where he's just, just talking. It's like, this is the Cold Rock stuff. Yeah. It's, it's Fresh Rock Flying Boat. It's the same beat. Interesting, it's an interesting thing that I want to share with you all about Russell Simmons is that he approached posters on many different occasions, and one of the things he approaches on, he wanted to sign us, but he wanted us to change our names to the Cold Crush Crew with KKK. And we was like, you're, we, you're a little bit insane with that, sir, so we're not going to do that. Okay. The um, Cold Crush Crew with KKK? Right, Cold. Instead of the C, put oh, K. Oh, K. K K K yeah, Cold Crush Crew. Like Ku Klux Klan? Yeah, yeah, K. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So we, we refused that. Okay. Um, and um, <laughs> when we talk about, we want to go back to the blueprint. Yeah. So Run, Run DMC were told to study our music, our tape, our show, because Russell told them you have to be better than them. Wow. So when you see running them and they and they bravado, the only thing that we didn't get in our in our quest is we didn't have the right production behind us mm-hmm. and we didn't have the machine. Because if we had the right production machine, then our trajectory would have been different economically. Mm-hmm. And I'm very happy that it didn't happen. I mean, other members won't agree with me, but I'm happy. That it didn't happen. <laughs> why not? I mean, why are you happy? Because I I don't think. Like, I don't live my life based on money. Okay. Right? Money is something that we need for survival, but it's not, it's not always about money. I think that you lose your self, your soul, and your aspirations when you start chasing money. And I think that, and I think, and I feel that we're embedded in the culture because we didn't get those things. Like, we are cemented in the culture. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what age you are, you hear the name Cocos Brothers and you act like you don't know it, something's wrong with you. It doesn't matter. Be like, yo, you don't know Cocos, yo, you don't, you don't know. Like, people get offended. Not me, mm-hmm. if you don't know Cold Crush. They're like, oh, you don't know Cold, you, don't, you, you ain't no hip-hop head. <laughs> you don't know Cold Crush? Like, you know. That was the standard. That was the barometer, right? Right. L.A., oh, we're going to go to L.A. I love, I'm saying I love L.A. Uh-huh. We came to L.A., I think, 82, 83. Played in this play club called the Radio. Uh-huh. At the radio, we ran into his brother. His name was Ice T. Uh huh. Ice T was like, "Yo, I'm gonna be a rapper. Yo, I'm gonna be a rapper. Boom, 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 boom. Yo, I'm, I'm gonna pimp you." He said, "Yo, let me show you my car and all that stuff." So he took us outside, showed his car. So one member in my group said, "You don't want to be in a group. You want to be a solo artist." <laughs> <laughs> so that's why Ice T is a solo to artist this day. <laughs> <laughs> But what did he, so I, I'm curious about your L.A. experience. Like, Man, what was that? Woo! With the Egyptian Lover, all these guys, Wild Battle Cat, the L.A. Dream Team, L.A. Posse, all these people. Well, we had, a, we had, we, well, we were rolling with the Booyah Tribe. The Booyah Tribe. So we rolled to L.A., the Booyah was with us everywhere we went. It was like family. We didn't understand how, how super respected they were in the community. Right. It was just, it was a lovely thing. Like, those brothers like family they were just they was with us we didn't we didn't feel none of those things that other people felt like mm-hmm. cold crush we got love because we gave love we never felt that we were better than our audience we were part of the audience if it was five people there we're going to give you the best show you ever seen it's two people the best show you ever seen so we always felt we was part of that part of the, the audience we play at the lingerie mm-hmm. at that place we played at some other places that I don't remember the name of it, but LA was cool. We was out there for 14 days. Um, we got some tapes and some things from different people. Um, well, what did y'all think of LA? Because it, it was it cool, was, but culturally there was a lot of difference. We right? I'm going to tell you, this is my my, my take on it. I, okay. didn't, I mean, first of all, you had to drive to go everywhere. That's number one. Okay. Um, and I didn't, I wasn't really in tune in that respect of the difference in the culture. Okay. It was just a place where it was warm. Okay. And we was coming to introduce the culture of hip hop to a place that was warm, and the people were open and they were inviting. Like it was no standoffish, nobody acting on hard and tough. It was like love, you know, 
authentic. Mm-hmm. So we, I, I like L.A. I mean, I like L.A. of course, and then they had some, they had some very unique type of uh, ladies in L.A. too. Mm-hmm. And so you know, I like that too. You know, when you say unique, A.D., what do you mean by I'm that? I'm saying they were, they were, they were built a little different. Like you know, they, they looked like they was, they were eating the same thing that the ladies were eating in New York. <laughs> <laughs> what pizza? Yeah. Pizza. So I mean, the vibration was incredible. I, I, I'm telling you, I love women. Mm-hmm. Like I have seven sisters. And I love women for many different reasons. Like people are like, oh, it's always it's not always a sexual thing for me. It's a vibration. It's about information. I'd rather I'm like I roll in with seven girls. Rick can tell you, I got seven ladies with me rolling. And everybody is hot. <laughs> because the vibration they bring, they open doors, they make people bow down. Mm-hmm. Like they recognize you in another way. Like I roll with the ladies, like dude. We were thinking about, I'm going. I'm moving a little different. No, yeah. We were thinking about battling, like, I had talked to Kev and Rob and them. I was like, like I was like, let's do verses. Cold Crest versus Fantastic. I was like, let's do verses, dude. And, and, you know, and they didn't vibe with that. But the idea I had to do verses, I was going to have, like, Wakanda, you know, the Wakanda women uh-huh. walk us out to the stage. And Cold Crest, like, Cold, Cold Crest. They was going to walk around and, like, with, their, you know, with the ball head. We, that would have been it. The show would have been over. Uh-huh. <laughs> and um, because I think that, you know, I've come from a woman and I understand like the vibration of a woman. So I love women in many different capacities. So I'm always going to be a ladies man because that's just how it works for me. I like it. Easy AD. I, I'm still a little swimming in L.A. because and I, I love your perspective, you know, because um, being from California, I just remember how it was for Californians when it came to relating to East Coast or New York um, artists or even in the business. But when we came, it was none of... It we, wasn't that. Right. It wasn't that divide. No, the whole East Coast, right. West Coast thing was right. non-existent, right. right? Exactly. So when that arised, what did you think? I thought it was... I, 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 I thought and I felt that it was very sad that our culture and our people were being divided based on where you live. Uh-huh. We all the same, honestly. We all the same. If you look in our DNA, most of our families from the south. Mm-hmm. Some of our family went to the west, went to Chicago, went to New York. So we all all family. So when that happened, it was just like I couldn't relate to it, like in my mind, on why wouldn't you like a brother or a sister from another coast because they live in another coast? It just doesn't make any sense <laughs> to me. Sounds silly when you say it, right? Yeah, it doesn't make any it's sense silly. to me. It's mu- it's music, right? You doing music, you got your flow. We got our flow, I mean, and do your thing. Like we went out, to, we, when, we, when we was in, 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 in L.A., it was about like the bands. Uh-huh. The bands, you know, we went to bands. We met some of the Prince uh, band members and we met a lot of, a lot of girls. A lot of back girls. to that, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Did you meet Prince? Oh, I met Prince when I, I met Prince in 1986 or 87 when I was in Paris. Mm-hmm. He was on a Love Sexy tour. Mm-hmm. Um, it was kind of cool, it was cool. Was he, was he hip to Cold Crush? I know, I mean, Prince is Prince, you know, Prince is like, I mean, I, I can say I was like Prince at the time, you know, I was like, okay. yo, I was expecting like, yo, what's up, how you doing, good to meet you, you know, keep it going. <laughs> it's no big deal, you know, it's no big deal, but, you know, I, um, it wasn't, it was, it was like more of an honor, it was an honor, like when you meet people that, 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 that inspire you in a different way, it's like an honor to meet them, like, for me, it was an honor to meet um, the owner of Black Enterprise. Mm-hmm. Earl Graves, mm-hmm. right, senior. So when I met him, um, it was an honor because, like, he's he was he's I think he's like six four, he's big, strong. It's a, he represented strength for me um, as a brown man mm-hmm. on a plane. It just it just it just stuck with me. And one thing he said to me is like, uh, he said own he said own own land or own property. He said that's that's a good that's a good thing to do. So I would remember that. To own land or own property. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm. I'm still like I'm. I'm LA. still. In, I'm still in L.A. But I'm we, a no, jump I'm out. Going we had a great time in L.A. Okay. I'm just saying the radio was one club that we we played in, and we met a lot of people who be, later became like prominent actors. We just knew that it, L.A. was nothing but love, family. Everyone stuck together. Like that's what we. That's what I got from L.A. Mm-hmm. You know, I got I got like a family vibe. You know, people look out for each other. That's what was my vibe from L.A. Okay. Um, Run DMC, I felt, was definitely from your lineage. When I saw the Beastie Boys, 
I thought they were like a carbon copy of Run DMC. That's correct. Okay? Yes. Who were a copy of Cold Crush Brothers. Bam! Wow. Okay? So, and these are white guys now coming into this culture that we, in a way we hadn't seen. That's correct. What were your thoughts? Did you feel like it was appropriation or it was okay? Well, you know, I would say it's, um, what were it? It's um, culture, I would say culture bandits at the particular time. Okay. Right, so we had envisioned, we, see, we saw this play out from the new addition to the new kids on the block. Uh -huh. So they were just doing that same dynamics in hip hop. And, you know, so yeah, I didn't, you know, I, I, I didn't vibe, I didn't vibe against them or with them. I was just, I, I was experiencing it. Mm hmm Yeah. Okay, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. So, you know, you got all these different stars in one group, you know, and then y'all, then the names start, rock, you know, building up and y'all making money. I don't know how much y'all was making per show. At what point, what was the highest y'all made per show back then? A hundred dollars each. Okay, what? <laughs> so we Talk about the eighties. Yeah, but damn, Rich, he was doing four shows a night. That's why they did so many shows. So you come home with four hundred dollars. That's correct. Well, well, well. Oh, you want to understand the um, economics? How we broke it down? So we paid uh, for f pictures, right? I had a fight with my members to pay for photographs because I would say, let's give our fifty pictures. So we gave a dollar for each picture uh -huh. to get them made, um, and we got the posters for free. So you got to take that out. So that's fifty. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, we came up with it. It was it was it was really good. It was. It was never about the money. Money. Yeah, that's interesting to me. It was never about the money. Like, four hundred dollars was like a lot. Four hundred dollars, but it was like the, the energy in which you receive from the audience and the vibration was like on a whole nother level. Like when I performed, I could not go to sleep for two days. Yeah. The adrenaline, huh? Yeah, because I didn't get high, so that was my high. Uh -huh. My high was on stage. I got high on stage. Mm -hmm. Like, I got turned on on stage. I remember, I can remember times when I'm on stage, I'm inside my body, but I'm outside my body watching me perform. Yeah. Like, if you never experienced that before, then you, you can't relate to that. But that, that's where I was. Like, I love performing. That was the ultimate orgasm for me. Was performing. Absolutely. Wow. So you gotta also remember rent at that time was three hundred dollars. Uh -huh. So if your house rent is three hundred dollars <laughs> and you come home with four hundred dollars in one weekend, one night, you doing okay. You're doing all right, right? Yeah. Um was it the money that because I mean you say the money wasn't important for but, me. For you. Right. But what role did that play in the group eventually going their separate ways? Well, if you look at the dynamics of groups, right, they they would find who they consider would be the best option. Mm -hmm. I would say not the best person, not the best MC, but the best option. That's what the industry would do. That's correct. Okay. So you look at the four MCs and you say, okay, who would be the best option? Who has the things that I know that I can control, mm -hmm. right? Whether it's drugs, whether it's money. And also you have to have the talent as well. So because we weren't making, I guess, enough money at the time, Everybody changes where you may have, you have kids, mm -hmm. more responsibility. So you have to start thinking more independent versus group. And so that's where the groups um, started, like, you know, moving, uh, breaking apart. Where um, KG did thing with um, B-Boy Records and mm -hmm. then uh, Aaron signed Kaz uh, with, uh, with Tough City. And... Uh, and so they no longer look, I don't think they no longer looked at, we never, well, again, we didn't look at each other as valuable, mm. right? I, I, I could say I've never entered that world as not valuable. I value everyone. Mm -hmm. And I always thought that there was always ways that we could, you know, do that. And JDL also did a record by himself, mm -hmm. right? And we had opportunities to sign with Warner Brothers, sign with CBS, um, but Tony was like the leader of the group, so sometimes those decisions was made in a vacuum just by him. Mm -hmm. And uh, so money became major because then drugs became, like people became addicted to drugs, right? So now they need the money to take drugs. And I just I didn't understand why you would want to give up something that was so valuable for something that was meaningless. Yeah. Like I don't understand, like how, like today if they say, all right, 
AD, you're going you're gonna to do this. I was like, cool, let's do it. I'm, I'm 100% in. What do you, you have to lose weight. You have to do this. You have to do that. You, and we do that, and let's make it happen. We can do it. So today, you would be willing to get, get back together with the Cold Crush members? Well, we, we, we're never apart. Okay. Right? We just have individual projects that we do. Okay. So we're still, as, we're still together, but we haven't had an opportunity mm -hmm. to um, be together and get enough economics to keep us together. Man, A.D., this has been a magnificent conversation for me. You know, I don't know about Rich. You know, he, he seemed to have, he, you guys grew up together. You know, Rich was right there. For me, thank you now. But I think for anybody that's uh, witnessing this conversation, um, you are such an integral, important pillar of what it is we do in this culture. And I want to personally thank you for being an inspiration to me, sitting down every time I've seen you over the years since I came to New York, you know, at that you know, I would be like, wow, this is easy AD. Rich would tell you. He would tell you, like, I can't believe that I'm, you know, colleagues with this man. You know, and so the other thing I appreciate about you is you, 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 your way of thinking, I think, um, has been very progressive since day one. And what you stand on is the kind of balance, the yang that's needed in this game even today. You know, you were a vegan before it was popular. How long you been a vegan? Uh, for a couple of decades now. Yeah. I think I, I started my quest in uh, 80, 85, 86 when I used to just drink wood root. Yeah. Wood root tonic. Mm hmm And um, when I, I think I was 12 or 13 and I stopped eating, like, chicken I, and pig feet because I woke up one morning and I told my mother I'm not going to eat that anymore. And she was like, okay, cool. Mm hmm So it was a progression, you know. Then I, you know, I, ate, I ate shrimp and then I, started, I gave up shrimp and, you know, moving. So I, I'm, I'm a pescatarian because... Uh, been in and out of veganism. I've been mm -hmm. in and out, right? So I eat wild salmon. Yeah. Ooh. Right? Okay. So that's about it. Uh huh. So, like, when you, that's the missing element, maybe, in the culture, you know, is our health. It's becoming prominent now because we're losing so many of us at such a tender young age. And a lot of it has to do with that, war that, that, that wear and tear of the early years of being an artist. We've all been artists, we've all toured, we've all partied. You know, and now it's paying dividends in the end. So um, I think your path is a path that has to be recognized and introduced as well as the creative that we contribute to this culture. Um, I was really happy when I heard you talking about the initiative, the Hill Project movement that you do, mm -hmm. right? Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. So Hip Hop Hills is a program that's geared to grades three, four, five, and six. It's a calorie literacy program, but we do it in a very unique way. It's like edutainment. Mm -hmm. It's like a concert, but we educate young people on healthy, making healthy choices, um, learning how to read menu boards, what are calories, um, and what are, what are gold foods, slow foods, and woe foods. Mm -hmm. And I've been actually doing that since 2007. Um, and I think that I'm an adult male. Mm -hmm. I do adult things. But inside of me, every day, I'm 10 years old. Yeah. I have to act like a adult because people may think I'm a little crazy. They'd be like, yeah, grown man, no. But I'm telling you, I have to be, I'm an adult on the outside, but I'm not on the inner side. Mm -hmm. I am 10 years old every single day. And so when I'm seeing myself and when I see myself talking, it doesn't feel like that's me. Wow. That's interesting because you you sound too adult. <laughs> yeah, <I think laughs> or the it's, person is for the kid inside. Right, it's it's like, like, it's, it's, you know, so but the, but the Hills program, we have done over maybe maybe three thousand three hundred thousand students in my in my career. And uh -huh. that you know, I think um, the initiative is just important to give young people uh, a a starting point in their life because if you're not introduced to something, then you never know, right? Mm -hmm. And I, and I just want to make sure when I'm going into the schools and I'm standing in front of 500 students, I look the part, I live it, and I am I am what I am. Yes. You know, I'm, I don't want to go in there and like they like, no, you, I don't want to be their grandfather. I want they, I want them to question, how old are you? Mm -hmm. When I tell them my age, they go, no, you're not. And they, they will argue with me and tell me I'm not that age. And that feels, feels really good. Yeah. You know, it feels good. I'm very honored number one, to be here with you and Rich, you know. Thank you. And, um, you know, thank you because, like, you know, in my life, in my quest, and um, I would say perfection, 
um, in my mind because there's no perfection. You know, I'm a Virgo, whatever mm -hmm. that means to most people. <laughs> and um, we think, a lot of us think before we talk. Like, I think a lot. I think about everything. I thought about what I wanted to say when I was here. That's why I would prefer questions, but I'm glad I didn't get them. Mm -hmm. And but just being around people who you that 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 really care about our culture, just beyond the individual, is, is very special to me. And so I'm glad to be here. And uh, you know, hope it's not my last time. Hope we can come again and talk about oh, some more stuff. Absolutely. I'll uh, bring some you know bring some things. I I mean, hip hop is like something like I don't understand. How don't you love hip hop? Yeah, and I'm, I'm not talking about rap. I'm talking about hip hop. Right. When you hear hip hop, that shit turns me on. Mm -hmm. That's like a that's, that's like a beautiful woman talking. You see, hip hop. Oh my god! Like, come here. Mm -hmm. Like that's what I feel <laughs> when I when I'm when I'm in, immersed in the culture of hip hop. It's amazing feeling. I've never like. I don't know. Like that's why I work with young people, mm -hmm. and I do hip hop health education because it helps me balance my life because I need that. I need that thing that's, that's in my DNA. And you know DNA is an incredible thing. An incredible thing. Oh, yeah. Easy AD. Yes. I appreciate you, brother. I appreciate you. I bet you never thought you would impact the earth like this, huh? Not, not at all. Yeah? No, not, I, didn't, I didn't think. I used to get on my knees and pray when I was like maybe 9 and 10 and saying that I want to impact the world like because I think um, Martin Luther King got killed and Malcolm X got killed and I used to get on my knees and pray when I was a little little kid and say I want to I want to I want to impact people I didn't use the word impact I said I want to do the things like they did to help people right and so I mean you did I, I have love I mean I have love I, I love is like a word that comes and goes but the experience doesn't yeah Easy AD, man. Come on. Thank you. Oh, Thank man. you. Living Legends. Living Legends. First episode. Living Legends.